All right. Welcome to Curator's Corner Dark Mirror with Barton Gelman. I'm Amanda Olke, Director of Adult Education at the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. Thank you for joining us today. Spy Museum historian and curator Andrew Hammond will be talking with Bart Gelman, the author of the acclaimed 2020 book, Dark Mirror, Edward Snowden and the American Surveillance State in just a moment. Gelman was one of the three people to whom Edward Snowden leaked highly classified files in 2013. The Washington Post shared a Pulitzer Prize for public service with The Guardian for the reporting that Gelman and his team did on the secret surveillance that the NSA had been conducting and how it was used to support national security. Andrew and Bart will discuss what it was like for Bart to work with Snowden. Their relationship makes for fascinating reading and I'm sure for a really incredible conversation. Um, he'll talk about what it was like to report on this tense topic and where your reporting takes you after pursuing a story with such critical significance and implications. Um, just really wanna thank everyone for being here today and over to you, Andrew, to get this going. Well, thank you, Amanda. Uh, and I'm really excited to be speaking to you today, Barton, and I very much enjoyed your book. Um, the first thing that I was thinking was, in the book, you say that you're, you know, setting out to set the record straight. What are what are some of the parts of the record that you thought most needed to be set straight? Well, that's interesting. Uh, there's been so much said about Snowden and so much said about the NSA. And I thought that the public debate was confined largely to these sort of cardboard cutouts uh, that Snowden is a hero, Snowden is a traitor. Uh, and I, I, I thought, as the world usually is, there was more subtlety and nuance there to be explored about uh, who he was, uh, what was his real backstory, what was his real motivation, um, how did he manage to extricate uh, hundreds of thousands of files from uh, the NSA? How, how did he turn information dominance on its head? I mean, the NSA's whole mission in life is to steal other people's secrets and to, and to safeguard American secrets. Uh, how did he uh, defeat that uh, so handily as one person? Uh, so I, I just felt that the, the nuances of the story had been lost and there were a lot of facts not known. And I try to tell those stories in, in, in the book. And I, I mean, I very much enjoyed the book and obviously would encourage our listeners to get a copy from the Spy Museum store, but could you just um, sketch out for people that haven't read it, you know, the book Dark Mirror, Edward Snowden and the American Surveillance State. What's the relationship between Edward Snowden and the Surveillance State? Is the Surveillance State something that would have happened even if Edward Snowden had never existed or was he, did he precipitate a particular inflection of that state? Help us understand that relationship between Snowden and the surveillance state. Snowden was a, a cog of the machine, a, a servant of the surveillance state, not, not an uh, enormously important person within the system. He had worked uh, both for uh, CIA and NSA, uh, uh, and both in, in uh, employee roles and contractor roles. He was a contractor at the NSA. Uh, he was an up and coming uh, system administrator. Uh, he had of the three tiers of system administrator permissions, he had the highest, uh, he had the deepest access uh, into secret spaces within the, the digital systems of the NSA. Uh, the surveillance state itself uh, grew up out of uh, ordinary espionage uh, operations that you know long predate the United States. That uh, you know we've been spying on each other uh, since the dawn of civilization. Uh, 
the modern surveillance state arose because there was a dilemma. Uh, it, in World War II, if you wanted to spy on the German high command, uh, or if you wanted to spy on uh, Japanese military communications, uh, those were distinct systems used by nobody else. Uh, they had their own codes, they had their own hardware, their, their own uh, frequencies, their own channels of communication. And so you, you spied on the Nazis, you were spying on Nazis and nobody else. Uh, in the later uh, half of the 20th century and, and, and at the turn of the century to the 21st, you found that uh, adversaries, uh, both state and non-state, were using the same communications links that everyone else uses. They were using the uh, global telephony system and the internet, uh, and they had their own uh, codes and ciphers and ways of, of, of using it, but they were swimming in the same waters that we all were. And so uh, espionage, uh, intelligence gathering, uh, started to impinge on the digital commons that we all use. And that raises all sorts of civil liberties issues and all sorts of issues about the relationship of a government to its own people. Uh, what's the boundary? What, do we consent uh, as Americans to having um, our government spy on us? And uh, Snowden uh, felt that we had not, that it had not been debated, uh, that there were things going on that he believed to be immoral and illegal uh, and dangerous to the political freedom uh, of, uh, of, the, of the people he was working for. Uh, so it's a, it's a long, complicated story, uh, if you put it that way. And one of the things that I found quite striking in the book was you discuss what it was like as a journalist to get this story. Um, you know, the, the whole process of, is this another wackadoodle who's telling me that they're, they have this information that's going to change the world or is it the real deal? And, you know, that whole story that you outline in the book is really fascinating. And another part that I found really interesting was in terms of, um, let's just say, uh, cyber um, self-awareness and cyber health check you were very much ahead of the curve at the time so walk us through that process of the story landing you know on your doorstep and and being you know being a reporter and sort of running with it well you're talking about the part of the book that i didn't think i'd write so i mean the, the <laughs> book is really three intertwining narratives it's it's who is Edward Snowden? Uh, what did he do? How did he do it? That's one storyline. Uh, one is the growth and development and, and reach of the modern surveillance state, uh, what the NSA is up to. And the third part that uh, I was reluctant to write because I'm trained to keep myself out of the narrative was a story of my own role and the way investigative journalism works on a story like this. So I had found that there seemed to be endless curiosity from people about uh, what was my relationship to Snowden and how did it start and how did we communicate uh, and uh, how did I decide what secrets to publish and how did I even understand the material uh, that came across that was so legally and technically complex. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, as you say, the very first question I had to decide was, is this anonymous, pseudonymous person who's entered my email box, uh, is, is he for real or is, or is he nuts? Uh, <laughs> any investigative reporter over the years will get a lot of tips from people who think they have a story of the century uh, and may be quite deluded uh, about what's true or what's important or what matters. And normally when I get a communication that says, uh, I have intelligence secrets that are gonna shake the world, uh, I'm not optimistic <laughs> <laughs> about uh, the prospects of, of a legit story. And so the very first contact I had with Snowden was uh, an email from someone who called himself Virax Latin for truth teller, who said vaguely that uh, 
there was a scandal brewing in the U.S. intelligence community. He wasn't even as specific as NSA at that time. Uh, that he had vital information to share, uh, and uh, did I want to establish communications uh, to share it? And one of the other things that I found really fascinating as well was, you know, you discuss different interpretations of Snowden, not in terms of how right or wrong he was, but also some people who say, well, he was a low-level employee, you know, he, he wasn't even qualified for the job that he had. He just managed to make the cut because, you know, we needed people like him at that particular time. And then there's other people like, he gives this brief on cyber counterintelligence with a specific focus on China. And the person who runs the conference in Japan says that it is without doubt, and I'm paraphrasing here, without doubt the single greatest uh, briefing I've, I've ever heard. Like, what's your, what's your take on that? Like, is, is Snowden both of those things? Or, or do you, yeah, do, give, give us a sense of how you sift through all of that. The people who knew him well and, and actually uh, worked with him or experienced his, uh, his, his work uh, all acknowledge he's quite brilliant. Uh, he's an autodidact. He uh, is not got much formal education. Uh, he, uh, he left high school because he was sick, uh, had mononucleosis for many months and never came back. He got his uh, GED. Uh, but he also, uh, he also got himself into advanced computer training courses. Uh, he sometimes just took the exams without doing the, uh, <laughs> the course itself. Uh, but it's a mark of his brilliance that he could master seven volumes of highly technical material on how to become a Microsoft certified security engineer uh, and take a seven hour test uh, to measure his understanding and, and pass it without even taking the course. Uh, he, if, if he put his mind to something, he did it. His, um, his, his IQ is off the charts. Uh, he, he was a low level employee if you measure it a certain way. Uh, but be careful who you hire as a system administrator because they have a <laughs> fairly wide reach. Uh, and because of the variety of his jobs uh, at the CIA, and the NSA, he had clearance into uh, uh, a large number of uh, the sort of fundamental compartments that are covered by uh, SCI, uh, uh, Secure Compartmented Information, which is above top secret. So he had, uh, he had HCS, the human control system from his CIA days. Uh, and he had, uh, he, he had the um, main compartments of the NSA to do his job. So uh, comment and ELINT and, uh, you know, and so on and so forth, as, as well as having the highest tier of access inside the system administration role. Uh, and so he could get his hands on uh, a great many of the diva secrets of the NSA. Uh, and when you're a system administrator and you are bent on penetration, you can uh, cover your tracks. You can delete logs. You can uh, you could do something that most people can't do, which is find a way to copy from the internal system onto uh, external storage media. I mean, one of the basic security measures uh, that any company has for its uh, big secrets is to store them on systems that don't allow you to insert a thumb drive, for example. But he, he found ways around that as well. And so we've, we've spoke about the process of you getting, you know, th this story coming to you. And we've spoke a little bit about who Snowden is now. Take us to the next step, which is something that you and I have discussed previously. Is it right or not to spill secrets? Like, Walk us through that calculus that you went through. Um, did you always think that I'm doing the right thing? This is part of the Washington Post who you had recently left tradition. So 
you know, I'm kind of working in that tradition? Or did you think to yourself, I have to be careful here, American lives are at stake? Walk us through that sort of process that you went through, Barton. So I've been asked that question less politely a number of times. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you can say, uh, who the hell is Bart Gelman or the Washington Post to decide what classified information, uh, if any, uh, should be put into the public domain. And that's a question I've thought a lot about. I actually did my, uh, my graduate thesis uh, on that subject uh, at Oxford. And it's Good not preparation. It's <laughs> little did I know uh, <laughs> it was not entirely hypothetical. Uh, let's put it this way. Uh, the government tries to keep secrets uh, and journalists try to find them out. Uh, and uh, I'd like to maintain that it is neither correct that all secrets should stay secret, uh, nor that all of them should be spilled. Uh, and the reason is there's an inherent conflict uh, between uh, the needs of self-government and the needs of self-defense. Uh, that secrecy is often, although certainly not always, beneficial uh, to national security. There are times when it very much is not, and I'd be happy to talk about those. Uh, there are times when the system overestimates the need for secrecy and, and defeats itself uh, by failing to bring in outside perspectives uh, and so on. But lots of times secrets are beneficial uh, to security. Uh, information is vital uh, to public debate in self-government in a democracy when the people are meant to be sovereign. Uh, and while it's true that as a journalist, I'm not trained to understand the full security information, uh, sorry, the full security implications of any leak, it's also true that the government, uh, even the president, is not competent to decide what the public needs to know in order to hold him accountable. I'd say, in fact, we we would we, we can't allow the president to have the power to rope off any piece of information uh, without limitation and say, you don't get to know this so that you'll never find it out and I won't be held accountable for it. Uh, so there's going to be a natural tension and a natural competition. Uh, but what most people, don't know, who don't follow the subject closely, is, is that uh, I don't publish everything I know. Uh, well, as an example, uh, I received more than 50,000 documents uh, from Snowden, uh, which covered a wide variety of information. Um, I certainly haven't made that whole trove public, nor did he want me to. I mean, Ed Snowden knows how to work the internet. If he had wanted to uh, spill the whole lot, he would have just put them up on the web the way WikiLeaks does. And he explicitly did not want to do that. Uh, there were many interesting stories uh, that I decided not to publish uh, because I judged that the harm would outweigh the benefit. Uh, and I judged that not just on my, by my own lights, but in consultation with the government. There were times when I would say to them, I'm uh, considering a story on this and that, and here's here's the, what the story is going to say. I'd like your comment on this. I'd like to, you to help me understand the full implications of it. And I did not invite them to censor me, and they they couldn't censor me. The, the decision was mine and the Washington Post's. Uh, but they would sometimes say, "We really wish you wouldn't publish that." Uh, now they wished I wouldn't publish any of it. Uh, but there were times when they were willing to make distinctions and say this particular aspect would be especially damaging. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, I wanted to write a story that would actually make the government's point, uh, because I thought it was a fair point, that the information uh, gleaned from electronic intelligence uh, was sometimes quite vital uh, to important objectives. And so, for example, uh, when it comes to uh, significant terrorist threats, uh, there were people who were fa found uh, and killed or captured on the basis of electronic intelligence. Uh, and I wanted to say, look, this sometimes happens for real. And uh, most people who wish the country well would want it to happen. Uh, and I said, I found these four names in the files who I've established are now dead uh, uh, and so no longer threats. Uh, what harm would there be 
in naming names. Uh, and the CIA told me that it understood my logic, but that in two of the cases, um, if I disclosed that the communications of that person had been intercepted, uh, then live ongoing operations against other people who communicated with that person uh, would be blown uh, and that that would be damaging. And that seemed perfectly logical to me. I couldn't prove it was true or untrue, but I, I recognized it. Uh, and uh, so we published two of the names and didn't publish the other two names. Uh, and I think that all sides of that conversation were satisfied that uh, sort of our, our equities had been preserved. So it's not quite as simple as I'm going to publish and be damned? No, it's not. Now, there were times when they asked me not to publish something and I published it anyway. And I'll give you an example of that. The first program I wrote about was called PRISM. It was a, it was an, a surveillance operation under which uh, the NSA obtained the content of uh, communications, uh, mostly emails and uh, private messages uh, from nine large internet companies. Uh, and it did so on a quite a large scale under new rules that threw away the old limitations uh, on uh, probable cause uh, and, and Fourth Amendment protections. And the government understood that I was going to publish this story. Uh, but the, uh, the chief lawyer for the uh, director of national intelligence asked me not to publish the names of the companies. And I asked, why would you say that? Why would I not publish those names uh, if I'm writing about the program? And he said, well, because if you write about it, uh, then they may be reluctant to uh, cooperate in the future. And I said, look, I got to tell you, uh, if the harm that you're asking me to avoid consists in the fact that uh, the American public might not like something when they read it and that the companies will therefore be deterred from doing it, that's not a reason not to publish. That's a reason to publish. I mean, the whole idea is to give the public the information it needs to make decisions. If, if the public says, we don't like this, we don't want you to keep doing it anymore, then that, that's a, a feature, that's not a bug. Uh, of our system. And so we went ahead and did publish the names of the companies. And for the, um, you know, so you get the story, you've made the, the decision that you're going to publish material sometimes in consultation with the government, sometimes not. But one of the parts of the, the book that I found really interesting, and to go back to the part that you didn't think you were going to write, that the, the sort of wilderness of mirrors, uh, the bewildering period after the, the Snowden story breaks and you have weird experiences with your email accounts, with spear phishing, uh, your iPad, your MacBook. Um, I mean, what was, what was that like to be, to know that you were the focus of um, all of this attention from undoubtedly some actors that didn't have your best interests at heart. <laughs> yeah, that was <laughs> uh, strange and stressful. Uh, there had been uh, people um, over the years who thought I was a little bit uh, excessive in my zeal to protect <laughs> sources <laughs> and reporting materials. Uh, and I might even have been described as paranoid from time to time. Uh, and uh, so I had become proficient uh, in the use of uh, encryption and anonymity and security tools to protect my notes. So uh, that as best I could arrange it, uh, no one else, uh, including my editors, um, had access to my reporter's notes. Uh, I took care with communications. I tried to make it so that if you simply went to my phone company and said, give me a list of all Bart's calls, you would not find my more sensitive conversations there. I used burner phones and anonymous accounts and so on and so forth. Um, when the Snowden story came along, um, all those precautions and more were required uh, because I became interesting uh, to a lot of outside actors who might not have 
noticed me before. Uh, and so I, I was demonstrably the target of uh, surveillance attempts and hacking attempts by foreign government agencies and by uh, quite likely by, by uh, random hackers, uh, not to try to uh, get my bank accounts, but to get the Snowden documents or to find out who I was talking to uh, when I reported around those documents or uh, especially to get information that I was holding back because I thought it shouldn't be published. Uh, so, I mean, there were, there were names and photos of uh, clandestine personnel in those files that I never even considered publishing, uh, but somebody wanted them. And so, yeah, I, I took out my iPad one day in the back of a taxi and it rebooted itself in front of my eyes uh, into uh, root access, which Apple tries not to allow anyone to have. Uh, and it started installing a new operating system uh, that if I had not seen that uh, in a couple of minutes, uh, the machine would have been secretly working for somebody else and not for me. Now, I, I didn't actually keep secrets on my iPad, but it showed me that someone had been willing to put considerable um, effort and uh, funds and expertise in hacking me because uh, zero day exploits for the iPad that are capable of working from uh, afar remotely without a physical connection to the device are rare uh, and expensive. Uh, that's, a, that's a million dollar hack. And I didn't wanna be worth a million dollars to somebody uh, to hack into my stuff. And I had, I had similar things happen to uh, my, uh, my MacBook to uh, the BlackBerry that I was using early on, uh, I would get these uh, apparently empty text messages or apparently empty emails that were actually uh, 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 delivery vehicles for uh, malware. Uh, fairly sophisticated efforts. There was there was one uh, piece of malware buried in what was alleged to be a new secret, uh, newsworthy document uh, that was customized just for me uh, and communicated with a, uh, a series of servers in, in uh, Russia and the former Soviet Union. Uh, now, I, I don't click on attachments <laughs> that uh, come to my email uh, without taking precautions. Uh, and so none of those attacks, as far as I know, succeeded, but uh, to be one person up against state-sponsored um, espionage is is does not give you good odds, and it was it was disturbing. Yeah, you mentioned in the book that you were a sophisticated amateur going up against an army of professionals. So um, it sounds quite scary. And just to just to run with that theme. Um, I mean, how do you, I'm just picturing it myself. This is the type of thing that would have me waking up at three o'clock in the morning in a cold sweat, you know? Um, for those of us that, you know, just imagine uh, scenes from the movies where you're, you're under all this pressure and you're screaming at family members or friends, or, you know, you're sitting in a closet, you know, having ripped the whole apartment apart. Uh, how do you, how do you just sort of manage to keep it all together and just stay focused on what it is you need to do? Because that, I mean, that must have been some serious like weight that you felt pressing down on you. I was on a lot under a lot of stress, uh, and I didn't feel that I could uh, discuss my security precautions with very many people at all. Uh, and I engaged in behavior that just frankly looked abnormal uh, to people I lived and worked with. So uh, I told the Washington Post uh, that in order to work on this story with colleagues, uh, we would have to do things that were not normal at all in a newsroom, which is about uh, sharing uh, information freely and conveniently. And I said that we were going to have to keep uh, the documents uh, in a heavy safe uh, on encrypted machines uh, that had been stripped of their communication hardware. So they were air gapped. Uh, we, 
the, uh, the encryption key could never be stored in the same room. Uh, door had to have a special lock and a video camera watching the door and uh, no one, uh, there would only be one other person who knew the combination to the safe and that person wouldn't have the encryption key uh, if they opened the safe and it, it, we could only communicate using uh, PGP or encrypted messaging and it, it was a long list. Uh, and the newspaper believed that there were security threats, but I think it mainly indulged me uh, in this. It was, um, well, this is the, the, the way Bart wants to work and he's got the documents, so we'll go along with it. I, I don't know how many people were actually convinced of the need. And I, th I think that, um, you know, one of the things that I found quite interesting was the title of the book, so Dark Mirror, you know, and I, I, and, and I quite like this metaphor. So just to run with it a little bit, um, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest <laughs> state of them all? Um, because this is about the American surveillance state. Now, you know, comparing apples and oranges, I wouldn't compare it to say China or uh, Iran, but in the grand scheme of things, like how, what, what does the American surveillance state look like when compared to the German one, the British one, the Australian one? Like, give us a sense of, of comparison here. That's a good question. I, look, I didn't write about the American surveillance state because it's the worst uh, or the only. Uh, you know, we're, we're not East Germany. Uh, the US government is not using surveillance uh, in an effort at political control of its own population. Um, it is not interested in the personal secrets of ordinary Americans or uh, political organizers. It's not spying on unions. Uh, it is, however, defining national security quite expansively. Uh, and so to take examples uh, uh, that have been made public long before me. Uh, the New York City Police Department uh, did intensive surveillance of mosques uh, all around the New York area in this, in fact, even out of state in New Jersey, uh, where it was penetrating ordinary mosques of ordinary worshipers on the suspicion that maybe some of these is, is Islamic people uh, might be sympathetic to terrorists and running sting operations and going way beyond the bounds of, uh, uh, of defensible civil liberties boundaries. Uh, I wrote about the American surveillance state because it's my country uh, and because it's uh, quite possibly the most capable uh, and extensive in the world. Uh, China does a great deal more surveillance of its own population by and quite deliberately and quite uh, despotically. And the Americans don't compare in that way, but no other country has a truly global uh, embrace of the internet and the, and the international uh, telephony network. Uh, no other country can, uh, can spy on almost anyone, anywhere, anytime. Uh, and that power is enormous and well-meaning people can abuse it. And we're getting a lot of questions coming in. So I'm going to bow out with a double barreled question. Um, and that question is, so, so, so basically before, before every interview, I always ask a friend the question that they would most like to ask the person I'm about to interview. And the question was, is Edward Snowden a Russian stooge? Uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. And I guess the, the, the follow-up question is, do you ever see him coming back to the States or do you think that he's forever um, yeah, exiled? Uh, so forever is a long time. Uh, and my crystal ball has uh, been broken for a long time as well. I, <laughs> I, I'm not very much in the prediction business. I sometimes tell people that if they catch me making a prediction, uh, and they can find a way to commoditize that, they should sell short and they will uh, <laughs> they'll profit more often than not. Uh, he's in Russia for the long term. Uh, 
Uh, it would be surprising if he left voluntarily at this stage. Uh, he would like very much to leave. Uh, he would uh, like to live in a free Western state. I'm not sure that his first choice would be America right now. I think uh, it might be too hot for him here uh, in a number of ways. Uh, but I don't think he thinks he can he can go to any of our allied countries uh, because they would extradite him. Uh, Russia is among the a tiny handful of states in the world that will uh, extradite to the United States for no reason at all. For, for the, we simply won't do it. Uh, and so he is safe there. There was talk of a pardon for him uh, under Trump. That didn't happen. Um, if it had, I'm still not sure he would have moved back to the States. Is he a Russian stooge? Uh, I think not. Uh, and I think I have good reason to think not. But all the arguments, uh, pro or con, uh, are circumstantial. So there is no perfect knowledge available here. Uh, the people who say he's obviously a Russian spy say, well, you know, no, no authoritarian state, no run by a former KGB officer is going to pass up the chance to uh, interrogate uh, a foreign spy when he comes to live there. Uh, and there's no way he'd be able to live there without cooperating. Um, that's a surmise. Uh, the People I've talked to uh, high up in the US government who have full knowledge of what the US government knows say they have no evidence uh, that he actually cooperated uh, or even brought documents uh, with him uh, to Russia. Uh, and that includes two uh, recently former deputy directors of the NSA who had access to all the information about uh, what he was doing over there. Uh, the other explanation for why Putin would, would host him is it's just a delightful propaganda item for Putin to say, uh, we are the true keepers of civil liberties here. There is a uh, young man here who uh, disclosed uh, evil doing by American uh, intelligence agencies who were violating civil liberties uh, and is now being politically persecuted uh, for that uh, whistleblowing action, and we are the country that is safeguarding him and safeguarding the principle of civil liberties. Uh, and Putin loves that. It's a it's a great uh, it's a great jab he can take, um, and in, in reversing American allegations against him. Uh, Snowden has spoken frankly of the efforts by the Russians to recruit him. Um, he said that he. Uh, refused those efforts. Uh, the circumstantial evidence uh, in large part is in his favor. For example, he was held at the airport, as you might remember, uh, when he first arrived from Hong Kong for 30 days, uh, and his status was ambiguous, during which he acknowledges that the Russians pressured him uh, to participate in, uh, to, to debrief. Uh, he says he refused. Now, one thing that you might consider is that he had continuous access to the internet that entire time. Uh, and he was in continuous communication with journalists and human rights people and was perfectly capable of saying, the Russians are pressuring me. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I, I'm afraid, I don't know what's gonna happen to me. Uh, they're forcing me, that sort of thing. Uh, people who come and cooperate with the Russians tend to disappear. Uh, they don't hold news conferences at the airport. Uh, they don't talk the journalists. Uh, I, I believe that Snowden uh, didn't cooperate. Um, I know that he did not bring the documents with him because he, uh, he destroyed his copies and he, and he destroyed his encryption key uh, before he left Hong Kong. And so he could not have turned documents over to the Russians. Uh, but can I know categorically that he's never cooperated? I, I can't. Uh, no one can. Thank you. Uh, over to Amanda. All right, we have lots of really interesting and varied questions coming in. Um, one suggests that three motives have been suggested for Snowden's actions, ideology, personal resentment against the system regarding career, um, deference to his high IQ, there are actually four here, money being a fourth. 
Um, what do you think? What, it, what was the mix of, of that or any of those off the table or does one seem to really have a, a greater uh, proportion of, of his drive to do this? Well, there, there are uh, lots of motivations in the world and uh, reporters um, are always deeply interested in understanding the motivations of their sources because it suggests uh, places to check. Uh, it suggests uh, ways of verifying uh, and things that need to be verified. You know, if you know that someone is motivated because um, he hates his rival at another agency, then you can assume that uh, you're gonna be getting only the negative stuff about the other agency and that you're gonna to need to look for additional perspectives on that. Uh, one, one character type that you come to recognize as a journalist and, and in life, I think, is the true believer. Uh, and I've had, you know, sort of scores and scores of hours uh, of conversation with Snowden and been able to take his measure. And he's a guy who truly believes what he's saying. Um, he's, uh, he's a zealot uh, and he sees the world in black and white. And he came to believe that uh, what he was doing was wrong, that the system he was working in was systematically uh, breaching the boundaries that he thought were appropriate uh, for an intelligence agency. And he thought the only cure for that was to bring it to public attention. Uh, he also was frustrated um, in his career uh, in that, that his talents were not being fully recognized. Uh, he, uh, if you're a, a sort of a loner and a genius and uh, don't suffer fools easily, uh, you have a tendency to be frustrated by bureaucracies. Uh, but uh, the idea that he just decided to lash out because he uh, wasn't being uh, recognized as a golden boy is wrong, partly because he was being recognized uh, by his own bosses and given unusual amounts of freedom to do his work. Um, he had just been accepted uh, into an elite unit uh, uh, at the NSA uh, uh, called uh, Taylor Access Operations. Uh, and so he was being recognized for his talent. Uh, he believed it was wrong what was happening. And that's what he says. And, that's his true motive, as far as I understand it. Um, one guest wonders um, why he took the volume of information he took, things beyond the, the scope of what was really troubling him. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, Snowden believed uh, that whistleblowers had tried before uh, to describe overreach by, by the system. Uh, and had been largely drowned out. Uh, they'd been disbelieved. They, they couldn't prove what they were saying. It was just their word against the system. Uh, they were described as uh, malcontents or uninformed and so on. He believed that there had to be extensive documentation to make the case. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, second of all, there is, a, there is a narrative out there among his critics that there might've been one or two or three things uh, in these stories that impinged on American civil liberties, like lis listening uh, or collecting uh, records of all the telephone calls uh, and uh, obtaining content from internet com communication companies in, 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 on large scale, but that most of the Snowden disclosures were, as uh, Jim Comey said, just intelligence porn. They were gratuitous. They didn't actually uh, have any impact on Americans. Uh, and I would strongly disagree with that. Uh, overseas operations uh, by the NSA, even ones that were targeting foreigners, um, had huge impact on American privacy. Uh, just to take one example, uh, the NSA, uh, using its lawful powers, broke into uh, the uh, internal cloud infrastructure of Google and Yahoo uh, at an overseas point. If they had done it um, at an American data center, uh, they would have been breaking the law. But because they did it overseas, uh, it fell under their authority. 
they said that they were looking for foreign targets. Uh, but what they did was scoop up at will vast volumes of information uh, about, you know, by, by essentially sifting through all Google accounts. Uh, and there are hundreds of millions of American Google accounts that, that are then swept up in a search like that. To say that that uh, is a foreign operation that's irrelevant to American civil liberties is just wrong to me. Uh, and one other thing, I asked Snowden why he didn't redact the information uh, that he gave me. Uh, for example, the PRISM briefing alone uh, which was 41 or 43 pages, I can't recall, uh, had in it things that as soon as I saw them, I realized that I was not going to publish them. Uh, identities of agents or uh, identities of targets uh, in live ongoing operations um, that were, that ed anyone uh, who believes uh, in American uh, intelligence gathering at all would recognize as valid targets, nation states and so on, doing things that any American would care about. Why didn't you censor this stuff? Uh, I asked him and he said, because if, you, if I gave you a document filled with black patches all over it, um, you wouldn't have believed it. You would have said, uh, you would have said, well, how do I know what this other stuff says? Maybe, maybe the stuff you blacked out is the part that says this is all a test and we would never actually do this. Uh, you know, uh, maybe, maybe there are things in there that justify the operation uh, in ways that I'm preventing you from understanding. I, I had to leave it to you to make the decision uh, of what to publish and what not to by your own journalistic lights and not trust me to do so. Um, one guess is wondering, you know, how, how do you have that moral compass about what to publish and not? And is there, you know, an ethical bond that journalists uh, share about, you know, altruistic motives on, on what to publish or not publish? Or is everyone just flying by their own rules? I realize it, it is disconcerting uh, for someone on the outside uh, to realize that uh, journalists have to make their own judgments and that there's no rule book. Uh, but I, I, am, I am looking to serve the public interest uh, as best I can and, and with, with, with the objective of holding powerful people and powerful institutions accountable for what they do. Uh, and so I ask myself, um, is the public going to be interested in this question, not as a matter of idle gossip, but are they interested because their own interests are affected? Uh, so if your private information is scooped up by the government and held uh, by the government uh, under rules that the government has actively dissembled about, the government has claimed that it doesn't do something, and then you find out that it does do it. Um, is that a matter of public interest? I would say clearly, yes, it is. Uh, is there a countervailing interest uh, that also is on behalf of the public uh, in security or some other interest that would make you hesitate to publish? So uh, I'm trying to weigh in all cases, uh, what is good for the sovereign people um, who are supposed to be at the heart of the interest of the US government. Um, I don't accept uh, that secrecy on behalf of the government itself is a valid concern. It, the government reports to us as people. Uh, so only where it's defending our interests, do I say uh, uh, this is a, a worthy factor I have, to, I have to consider. But what th the cure for the subjectivity of that is that there are consultations with the government. And it's not just me, this, this happens routinely uh, with uh, with people from mainstream news organizations who uh, obtain this kind of information. And there is a set of people in government who understand these conversations have to be realistic and that we're never going to say that we'll quash any story you don't like uh, and that they have to give us reasons and reasons that we can understand. Uh, and 
generally speaking, I think that system, as imperfect as it is and as messy as it is, um, is better than any uh, set of sort of ironclad rules that I can think of. Um, one guest mentions that in your book, you write that an intelligence person told you that our security capabilities could penetrate the extreme measures you took to protect um, the Snowden data. And so thus could, or it's logical to think other countries, intelligence agencies could have breached that data. Any thoughts on that? And also, you took great care. What about Laura um, Poitras? If I'm, I've never known how to pronounce her name, and Glenn Greenwald. Did they take as much care as you did? So it was a very disconcerting conversation I had over lunch with Rick Leggett, who was uh, had just retired as deputy director of the NSA. And uh, we talked about the uh, InfoSec uh, procedures that I used. Uh, and I said, look, I did everything I could to recreate the atmosphere of a SCIF a secure compartmented inf information facility uh, in government, uh, best I could do with sort of civilian resources and technologies. And he did just say matter of factly that uh, we could have, we could have, if 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 it were legal for us to go after you as a target, we could have penetrated um, those defensive measures that you took. And therefore, uh, he said to me, I expect that Russia and China uh, were able to get whatever they needed from you. Uh, and that was distressing to hear. It was not shocking. Uh, I felt that all I could do and what I was obliged to do was the very best I could, that I should take every available measure to me. Uh, that, uh, and I mean, we're starting from the fact that Snowden did remove documents and did share them with journalists. All you can do is your best. Uh, I do think that it is much more likely that if uh, foreign agents got hold of the material, they got it from someone else than me, because I, I think I made it challenging. Yeah. Uh, uh, Laura, Laura Poitras took quite extensive security measures, um, Glenn Greenwald much less so. Mm -hmm. um, Guest wants to know when um, Snowden resigned, was fired from the CIA, CIA. Why didn't the CIA impact his security clearance since it appears they had a clue that he might have had some sort of ax to grind? Uh, Snowden was a bit of a troublemaker inside the CIA, um, even uh, from his training days uh, before he was uh, made a, a, a technical communications officer. Uh, he had a history of making complaints uh, and he did things that uh, according to the strictest interpretation of the rules, maybe he shouldn't have done uh, for uh, what he believed were good reasons. Just for example, he, he discovered that the uh, personnel evaluation system that was being used uh, by the CIA uh, had security flaws in it uh, and he, brought that to the attention of his bosses and nothing was done to change it. And so he did a demonstration of the fact that there were security flaws. There. He, he, uh, he limited himself to simply arbitrarily changing the color of the text uh, on the screen, but he said he could have changed anything on the screen, including he could have changed his own personal evaluation if he had wanted to. Uh, and he brought that to the attention of his superiors. They were embarrassed and pissed off uh, and put a reprimand in his file for having changed the color of the text on the screen. Uh, so he, it, there was enough uh, friction there that he came to believe that his future was less than bright uh, inside the CIA and he resigned. Uh, there are people who say CIA should have recognized that this was a troublemaker and, uh, and retracted his clearances. Uh, I don't know about that. I mean, I think it's a, it, it depends on what level of, of, uh, of initiative and independence you're willing to accept from your employees, uh, but they didn't w withdraw his clearances and he hadn't done anything that was illegal. Uh, and so he wasn't treated as a pariah. 
Now, one guest asks if didn't Snowden violate the law merely by disclosing this information to you, um, but I think he violated the law just by taking the information. Yeah, well, I'm not a lawyer and I can't make the legal judgment, right. but I, but right. I, I will I will say as a as a as a as an using ordinary language and ordinary understanding of of uh, what the rules are. Uh, that Snowden just uh, obliterated legal boundaries um, over and over and over again. Yeah. Uh, he um, he had lawful access uh, to most of the information uh, that he took, uh, although I'm not sure that applies to all of it. He didn't have a need to know some of the things. Uh, he had the ability as a system administrator with certain clearances to get at them, uh, but uh, internal regulations would have said he shouldn't do so unless he had a need to know in order to perform his job. Uh, when he copied them onto uh, thumb drives, uh, he clearly breached the law. Uh, when he removed them uh, from the work site, um, he now had un unlawful possession of the material. When he gave them to me, whether or not I published them, um, he, uh, he violated the law, and, and that's probably not an, ex an, an inclusive list. Uh, so I mean, there's no doubt that, that, that he violated the law. Uh, the, the objection I have to the way the, the, way the legal uh, framework is set up is that uh, prosecutors uh, are alleging that what he committed was espionage. Uh, and since we're at the International Spy Museum, we should be clear about what espionage is and isn't. Ordinarily, our, our ordinary understanding of what espionage is, is when you secretly uh, steal information and deliver it to a foreign adversary, uh, uh, having transferred your allegiance uh, from your own country uh, to the foreign country and hoping that your theft is never found out. I mean, the very best kind of spying is spying when the victim doesn't even know it happened. Uh, what Snowden did was openly uh, make his name public, openly affirm that he had taken the material and was giving it to the American public for its own benefit as he saw it. Uh, and motivation does matter uh, in, uh, in most crimes of this sort. Uh, so it and for the purpose of reform in his own country. Uh, he did not transfer his allegiance to another country. Uh, he took shelter in another country. Uh, and so to charge him with espionage is problematic, just in terms of commonsensical, what, you know, what does espionage mean? And it also has legal implications for his defense. Um, he is, if, if he were brought to the United States and put on trial, he would not be able to mount a public interest defense. He would not be able to even describe his motivations for doing what he did. Uh, the elements of the crime are that he had lawful access to the information and he gave it to someone who didn't have lawful access uh, and that's espionage. And uh, that means that even, even if every single program that he disclosed was subsequently found to be illegal by the Supreme Court, every single one of them, that's not the case. But even if that were true, he would still be guilty of espionage. Mm. Uh, and that just makes no sense to me. Well, we have so many questions, but they are too meaty to undertake the whole, where do we go next? So I, I apologize to the viewers and a whole wonderful range of questions about Julian Assange that we will not get to. So maybe a part two someday, Bart, if you would ever join us again, because you are really fascinating and I, I thank you uh, for being with us and Andrew for asking such great questions and, and thoughtful questions. And I wanna thank our, our viewers for listening in. And I have to bring it to your attention that today, SPY is participating in Do More 24. And this is the DC area's largest annual 24 hour online fundraising campaign. And if you would consider making a gift through our Do More 24 page today, I'm sure that 
Hannah and Shauna will drop it in the chat and we would be mighty appreciative. And it's how we do great programs like this one and have terrific people like Bart speaking to you um, today uh, for free. We have a program next Wednesday. Andrew is back and better than ever. We're talking to Barry Mayer about his new book, Spooked. And he had a really cool article in the New York Times over the weekend. So another great guest coming up next week. Check our website calendar to register for these and more. Buy Bart's book if you haven't already. I know that it is in um, dropped in the chat. Uh, we have it for sale at the bookstore. And any final remarks, gentlemen, after I yacked at you? All right. I'm, I'm just happy to have been here and glad to come back anytime. Appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, just really super briefly, um, you know, I, I've heard it said that STEM will get us out of the pandemic, but the humanities will get us through it. Um, and I think that, you know, I just want to take a second just to recognize Amanda, Hannah and Shana, because since the beginning of this pandemic, week after week, they've been putting on these programs to try to keep us all sane and try to try to educate us about these important issues. So yeah, thanks guys. Aw, well, thanks everybody. It's quite a love fest here at the end. So we'll, <laughs> we'll end on this glorious high note, Bart. We will see you soon. I'm gonna take you up on your offer. Great, thank you again. Thank you. Bye.